Welcome to a unique collection of beautiful gardens, celebrated art, and a remarkable research library. So, just how did this place come to be? Henry Huntington was a businessman, a very successful businessman. He was also a collector of plants, art, and books. Lots of books. His remarkable collecting became the foundation of this place. But let's start at the beginning. Henry's first visit to Southern California was in the spring of 1892, when Los Angeles was already changing from a small town into a major metropolis. The arrival of the cross-country railroad in California brought waves of Western migration from across a post-Civil War America. The railroads marketed Southern California as a sunny paradise, a place of bountiful resources with limitless opportunities. On that first visit, Henry stayed as a guest on the working ranch that was this property. With its fragrant air and stately oak trees, Henry, a native of New York, was hooked. He was en route to San Francisco, going to work for his uncle, the railroad king, Collis P. Huntington. Uncle Collis was the wealthy ringleader of the Big Four, owners of the Southern and Central Pacific Railroads. Their fortunes had swelled with the completion of the first transcontinental railroad back in 1869. The U.S. government had granted extensive land rights and paid thousands of dollars to the railroad companies for every mile of track laid. While thousands of railroad workers did the heavy lifting, the Big Four struck the big deals. America's Gilded Age was ushered in. creating entire industries that made an ambitious few extremely wealthy. As men like Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and Collis Huntington made their fortunes, it became fashionable, and even expected, that the wealthy would invest in philanthropic endeavors. They created museums, universities, hospitals, and research centers. These men also built extravagant homes, creating estates as stylish monuments to themselves. In San Francisco, Henry settled in with his first wife, Mary Alice, and their four children. He rose through the ranks of the railroad empire to become his uncle's business protege and confidant. When Collis Huntington died in 1900, the railroad king left behind an amount of wealth that is hard to imagine. Shares from Collis's mammoth railroad stocks were divided between his favorite nephew, Henry, and Collis's second wife, Arabella Huntington. Collis had met her 30 years earlier while still married to his first wife, Elizabeth. Arabella had one child, Archer. In all likelihood, he was Collis's son. After Collis's death, Arabella spent the next few years traveling between her New York and Paris apartments. She wore her wedding ring and dressed in black for the rest of her life. With the settling of the estate, a correspondence developed and a relationship deepened between the two heirs. Arabella spent lavishly in Europe on clothing, artwork, jewelry, and furniture. The sum total of her purchases brought back from Europe in 1902 
was the largest amount ever declared by a traveler in the Port of New York. Meanwhile, Henry turned his attention to Southern California. With his business partners, he incorporated the Pacific Electric Railway Company in 1901. The PE, or red car system, whisked Angelinos from downtown Los Angeles to the quickly expanding suburbs, where they could purchase property from one of Huntington's own real estate companies. Envisioning a burgeoning city served by his rail systems, he bought up land and invested in power and water. The profits rolled in. Late in 1903, he bought the peaceful ranch near Pasadena, where he had stayed as a guest 12 years before. With an eye to European estates, Henry hired young landscape architect William Hertrick to transform the property and develop his gardens. A staff of laborers was hired to assist in the ambitious construction, grading land, moving oak trees, and planting here in the warm climate of San Marino. With more and more people arriving to the land of sunshine and avocados, Henry's Los Angeles investments soared. He shifted from being a casual book collector to purchasing entire libraries and became a major buyer in the elite antiquarian book market. In 1911, he bought what was then the most expensive book ever sold, a Gutenberg Bible for $50,000. With his first marriage over, Henry settled permanently in Southern California on this property. Architects Myron Hunt and Elmer Gray were hired to design Henry's dream home. Henry wrote to Arabella about the house. They were contemporaries, and his fascination with his uncle's widow grew. A sophisticated tastemaker herself, she encouraged Henry to begin collecting art enlisting her longtime art dealer, Joseph Devine, to decorate the mansion. Many details of the home were custom crafted in Europe. They were shipped across the Atlantic and freighted across the country by private rail right to the estate. Between 1907 and 1909, Henry spent $2 million on paintings, decorations, furniture, and statuary. Three years after construction began, the Huntington Mansion was completed in 1911. The press called it Huntington's Palace. After decades of close friendship, Henry and Arabella, now in their 60s, were married in Paris. In 1914, as Europe entered the First World War, they moved into their home here in San Marino. The Huntington's extravagant collecting continued. Like others who had gained similar fortunes and collections, they began to think about their legacy. What would they leave behind? How would they be remembered? With an assembled board of trustees, including Archer Huntington, Henry and Arabella co-signed a deed of trust in 1919, endowing the estate as a research and educational institution to be open to the public upon their deaths. Shortly after Henry's death, the Huntington opened its doors for the first time. Following the direction set by its founder, the collections have continually grown, with some shifts in emphasis. 
including materials related to California and the West, and an expanding American art collection. Over 700,000 visitors explore the Huntington annually, including thousands of schoolchildren. Each year, more than 1,700 scholars glean new insights from the library and art collections. Their academic pursuits have led to best-selling books, acclaimed documentaries, school textbooks, and literary and historical accolades. It's also become an important place of study for botanists looking to protect, propagate, and distribute plants from around the world. A dedicated staff of more than 400 maintain the Huntington and care for its collections. Welcome to the Huntington. We're glad you're here. Yeah. 